Hello, everybody. So today we are going to continue talking about the different categories of tissues in the body. This is video number three of this, because if you remember, when we look at tissues, we actually have four categories of tissues. And this is why in my anatomy class, we start talking off about chemicals, because you have to understand the chemicals and what chem how chemicals work to understand how the cell, what kind of cells we have, and then how the cells work in order to understand what kind of tissues we have. And all the trillions of cells in your body come together to form just four types of tissues. Now, in one video, we talked about epithelial tissue. And epithelial tissue makes up the linings and the membranes and things like that in your body. And then we talked about how that was classified according to its shape, like squamous was flat, cuboidal, cube shape, columnar, obviously columnar, and how many layers they had. If you're simple, you're just one layer. And so your job was to secrete or absorb. And if you were stratified, that meant you're multiple layers and your job was probably to help hold things in place or line and help protect. We then had connective tissue, which is what this video is going to look at today. But muscle tissue is what makes up our muscles. It's there to move. And we talked about how you had three different types of muscle tissue. You had skeletal muscle, which makes up your skeletal muscles, which attach to your bones and they're voluntary and striated. Then you have cardiac muscle, which makes up your heart muscle, and it's involuntary and striated. And then we had smooth muscle, or it's also called visceral muscle, which makes up a lot of your hollow organs, and it is involuntary and non-striated. We'll do a unit just on muscles later on. We also have nervous tissue, which can, is composed of neurons, which are the nerve cells, the cells that actually make electricity, and what are called neuroglial cells or supporting cells. They're going to help the neurons do their job. But what this video is going to focus on is the connective tissue group. And connective tissue is kind of a hodgepodge. If you're not aligning, um, you're not epithelial tissue. If you're not muscle tissue or if you're not nervous tissue, we have to put you somewhere. So we tend to put you in the connective tissue. And so it can literally connect things together like your tendons and ligaments, or it can figuratively connect things together like your blood because it connects the parts of your body because it moves all around and carries things. So when we look at connective tissue, we actually take connective tissue and it's divided into three different groups. And again, it gets its name because it binds the cells and organs of the body together. And with connective tissue, connective tissue has uh, the actual cells in them and then a lot of fibers. And a fiber that we're gonna see over and over and over and over and over again is collagen fibers. Collagen fibers is one of the strongest fibers that we have in our body. It actually, you know, holds, it's the fibers that hold our skin on. And we'll talk about that when we do, when we talk about skin. And collagen is a cordiary protein. It is one of the most advanced proteins that your body can have. And when you're young, your body will make sure that the collagen stays as tight as it's supposed to. But over time, the collagen will start to stretch. But once collagen stretches, it can't fix itself. So in young people, your body will take the time to replenish that old cartilage, I mean, that old collagen. But the, by the time you get to like my age, your body's like, okay, that's a lot of hard work. Is the skin still on there? Okay, then I'm not gonna worry about making the collagen. And so as your collagen stretches, your skin sags and that's what causes wrinkles. But when we look at dense connective, when we look at connective tissue, we divide it up into three different groups. We have what we call dense connective tissue, loose connective tissue, and kind of like a leftover hodgepodge group that we just call specialized connective tissue. Now what dense and loose is talking about is how are the cells arranged? So when we look at connective tissue, okay, connective tissue can have a lot of space between the cells. And so this is how we take connective tissue and divide it into a dense category or a loose category. What we're looking at is cellularity. When we talk about cellularity, we're talking about how tightly packed are the cells. So if you see loose connective tissue, that lets you know that the cells are not tightly packed. And so they have a lot of space in between them that nature then fills up with different particles. If you have dense connective tissue, that lets you know that these cells are tightly packed together and there's not a lot of space or extra stuff in between them. So when we talk about this space, I talk about this extra stuff that's in between them. And so the space is not empty. 
or else it wouldn't give us the strength that we need. But this space between the cells is full of fibers and other stuff. So as we go through the year and we talk about different types of tissues, you're going to see the term ground substance a lot. Ground substance is whatever is found between the cells. So for example, bones. Bones have calcium, potassium, phosphorus. You know that. These are things that bones store. Well, they store it in the space between the cells. So calcium, phosphorus, all that would be examples of ground substance. Blood is a tissue. A lot of people don't think of blood as a tissue. They just think of blood as blood. But blood is a tissue because by definition, tissues are groups of cells that work together. And in blood, you have red blood cells, white blood cells, and thrombocytes, which are commonly called platelets. And you guys, well, what's plasma? Well, plasma is the ground substance. It's the water and all the dissolved things that are found in the water. So when we look at connective tissue, we're gonna talk about ground substance. Now, if I ask you to give me an example of a ground substance, you're gonna tell me something like calcium, phosphorus, water, something along those lines. But when we talk about the state of the ground substance, we're talking about the matrix. Now, in the case of the matrix, you can only have three choices. You're either a solid, a liquid, or a gel. So for example, the matrix of bone is a solid, but ground substances would be calcium, potassium, things like that. The matrix of blood is a liquid, but ground substances would be water, dissolved minerals, things like that. In the case of solid matrices, the only two tissues we're gonna talk about that has a solid matrix is bone and teeth. In the case of a liquid matrix, the only things that have a liquid matrix is blood. Everything else is gonna have a gel matrix. So this is how we look at loose connective tissue, dense connective tissue, and the hodgepodge leftover group that we have to put somewhere, specialized connective tissue. Now loose connective tissue gets its name because it lets you know that the cells are not tightly packed together. There we go, they're loosely packed. And so when you look at this picture, this picture is a little misleading because these cells are swollen. But these cells were their normal size, there'd be a lot of space in between them. With loose connective tissue, you're gonna have a lot of ground substance. We're not hollow. So our tissues don't have empty space in between them. We take that space and we fill them up with different things. And in loose connective tissue, we actually have three kinds. Now, you know that I highly recommend that you purchase an anatomy coloring book. This is the version that I have. So when I talk about it in my videos, I'm using this version. But a lot of what we're doing in this PowerPoint, you can find in this coloring book. So for example, page nine in my coloring book talks about loose connective tissue. You'll see um, areolar tissue, you'll see adipose tissue. It talks about dense connective tissue. And page 10 in this book talks about cartilage and bone and other kinds of connective tissue. So if you have this coloring book, as we talk about the different kinds of connective tissue, you might wanna be on pages nine or pages 10. If you have a different version of this coloring book, you can kind of flip through because obviously page numbers differ, but up at the top, you'll talk about tissues and connective tissues and things like that. But in the case of loose connective tissue, in this coloring book, you can find it on page nine. Now, page nine only talks about two kinds of connective tissue, and we're gonna focus on this PowerPoint three. But as you can see, there's areolar, adipose, and reticular. Now, if you have the anatomy coloring book, it talks about areolar connective tissue. It talks about adipose connective tissue. And it's got these little descriptions. It mentions that loose areolar connective tissue. It's characterized by many cells a loose irregular arrangement of fibers and a viscous fluid matrix that's kind of like a gel and it goes on to talk about adipose connective tissue it's an aggregation of fat cells which is what you're seeing in this picture here this is an example of adipose tissue and adipose tissue is what most people think of as our layer of fat its job is to store the fat that's going to help insulate our body that's going to help protect organs and again, in your coloring book, you can see a drawing that talks about, in case you haven't noticed, yes, that was Darth Vader, and I have a Princess Leia shirt on. 
very, very, very into Star Wars here. But anyway, so in the case of adipose tissue, this is what we have right underneath our skin that helps keep us warm. It helps protect our bodies. And it can swell. You know, we can add cells to that. That's how we gain fatty layers. We also have loose areolar tissue. And loose areolar tissue is also in your anatomy coloring book on page nine. And in this case, you can see that these cells have a lot of space in between them. If you'll notice, these guys here are the cells. You can see all the empty space that goes around them. And you can see all these fibers that run through them. And again, a lot of these fibers, these thick fibers, are collagen fibers, incredibly strong fibers. Because in the case of areolar tissue, it forms what's called the basement membrane. And we talked a little bit about the basement membrane when we did epithelial tissue. Remember, epithelial tissue, these membranes line something. So they cover it or they line the inside of it. And so I always compare epithelial tissue to saran wrap. And you guys know, unless you take the bowl and wrap the saran wrap all around it, the saran wrap slides off pretty easy. Well, epithelial tissue can slide off pretty easily. So we need something to tie, to attach, to glue the epithelial tissue to the organ that it is attached, that it is surrounding or lining. And so we have what's called loose areolar tissue. And so you would have the saran wrap and then you would have the bowl. And in between that, you would have this areolar tissue, which is also called the basement membrane or the basal lamina. And again, it contains high, 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 high amounts of collagen fibers. And like I mentioned, in the case of your skin, your skin has two layers to it. It has the epidermis, which is epithelial tissue, and it has the dermis, which is the actual organ. Okay. People talk about the skin as an organ. It is an organ. It's the largest organ you have in your body. And, but what you're touching is not the organ. You're touching the membrane around the organ, and that's your epidermis. And so we have to keep our epidermis from sliding off. So we have this layer of areolar tissue between the epidermis and the dermis. Well, like I mentioned, collagen fibers over time will stretch. And collagen fibers are really hard to make. And so as you get older, your body has to kind of, it's like, I'm tired. You know, I don't wanna make any more collagen fibers. As you know, the skin, okay. The skin is still hanging on, it hasn't slid off yet, I'm fine if it's a little saggy. And that's what causes wrinkles. Now, what's not in the coloring book is what's called reticular connective tissue. And you can see that this is a very different picture from the other two types of loose connective tissue. These purple dots are the cells, and you can still see that there's a lot of space in between it. That space is probably filled up with a gel with different types of ground substances in it. And you can see these fibers running through it. Anytime you see reticular, reticular contains what are called reticular fibers. That's where it gets its name from. And reticular fibers, I always think of them as a spider web. Reticular fibers are used in filtering. So anytime you see an organ that talks about reticular tissue, that organ's job is to filter something. So we're gonna find it in like our kidneys, our spleen. We also helps form soft internal skeleton for all of our different organs. Like I said, kidneys, liver, spleen, tonsils, these all contain uh, connective uh, reticular connective tissue. So in the case of loose connective tissue, we have three kinds. We have areolar, adipose, and reticular, which then leads us to dense connective tissue. As you can see in these pictures, dense connective tissue gets its name because the cells are tightly, tightly, tightly packed. And on page nine in your coloring book, you can see dense connective tissue, and you can see irregular connective tissue. And sometimes an artist drawing makes it a little bit easier to understand than an actual photograph. But what we're seeing here in the first part, this is dense regular. Now in the case of dense regular, it uses its name because it has a nice regular pattern to it. Think of the cells as being tightly packed and stacked. So think about having bricks or think about having um, logs stacked on top of each other. Well, by having this nice pattern, it adds strength. So dense regular connective tissue is some of the strongest connective tissue we have in our bodies. And it actually makes up our tendons and our ligaments. If you're not quite familiar with the difference between these, 
tendons are what attach your skeletal muscle to your bone, like your Achilles tendon, or your, uh, and then ligaments connect bone to bone, like your ACL. Now, the second picture here is what's called irregular dense connective tissue. And you can see in the drawing here, it's not as tightly stacked. I always think of it growing up, we had this game called pick me up sticks. It was all these really long toothpicks in different colors. And you would actually just take them and drop them on the floor. It'd just be like you taking toothpicks and just dropping them. Some of them would cross over, some of them would lie side by side, some of them would you know, go off in different angles. Well, that's kind of what dense irregular connective tissue looks like. And you can see here, there's not really a pattern. They're, they just might be, they're not really stacked. They might be lying side by side. One might be lying on top of the other, but it makes them a little bit more flexible. And we're gonna talk more about dense regular, connect, irregular connective tissue when we talk about the dermis of the skin, which then leads to our last group of connective tissue, which is the hodgepodge group. It's the specialized group. Now, page 10 in your coloring book talks about some of these types of connective tissues. Blood is not in here because it's later on in the coloring book where it talks about the different parts of your cardiovascular system. But blood is a tissue and it's the only liquid matrix that we have in our body. And you can see here how there's a lot of space in between it. And just to let you guys know, the red ones are obviously red blood cells and these kind of bluish purple ones are white blood cells. But blood is considered to be a tissue because it does connect the parts of the body together. And it's used to transport nutrients, hormones, waste products. And again, by definition, tissues are groups of cells that work together. And tissues are made up of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, which are also called thrombocytes. And those are gonna be used in blood clotting. So by definition, blood is a, uh, a tissue. So if I were to ask you if the matrix, you would tell me it was a liquid. If you were to ask me, if I were to ask you ground substances, you would tell me like water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, things that would be found in the liquid portion of the blood. Now, we also have osseous tissue, which is what makes up bone. Now you have 206 bones in your body. And when you think of a bone like the femur or your phalanges, those are actual organs. And remember, organs are groups of tissues that work together. Well, the type of tissue that makes up most of the bone is called osseous tissue. And it does talk about bone on page 10 in your coloring book. And in the case of osseous tissue, this is a picture of bone. It forms a very, very, very specific pattern. And this is what's called, um, or a bullseye pattern. Actual bone cells are called osteocytes. And where you see these little black lines, like these little black circles, if I can get, let me choose a different color. These little black circles here, okay. those black circles are called lacuna. And it does mention lacuna in your coloring book. This is where the bone cells live. When we are first born, we don't have, our skeletal system is mostly cartilage, which has, think of it as like wet cement. And over time, the wet cement begins to harden. Well, our bone cells, it'd be like me putting you in a swimming pool and dumping a bunch of wet cement on you. You would try to dig yourself out an air pocket. Well, the bone cells have their little homes that they live in, their little air pockets. And that's what's called a lacuna. Now the matrix itself would be a solid and the matrix, the hard part of the matrix, I mean, all, let me use a different color all of this stuff in here, that would be what's called the lamella, L-A-M-E-L-L-A, -L -L -A, your lamella. That's the hard portion of the bone. And it makes what we call compact bone. Compact bone is the really, really, really strong part of the bone. And when bone is made, it's made as compact bone. And it forms this bullseye pattern because what we have right here in the middle is a blood vessel. And that blood vessel you'll see is called the Herbergian Canal. And again, if you look in the coloring book, if you have it, it mentions the Herbergian Canal. That's the blood vessel. And that's where it's gonna get their nutrients from. So the blood cells begin to circle around and you would have another Herbergian Canal up here and you can see that there's more circles up there. But we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about 
perversion canals, and the structure of bone when we're actually doing the skeletal system. But bone is a tissue, so we need to talk about it here. Likewise, cartilage is a tissue, and you have three main types of cartilage in your body. You have hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibrocartilage. Well, in this picture here, you can see how there's a lot of space between the cartilage cells. This right here is a cartilage cell. This is a cartilage cell. All of this stuff here is the matrix. It's the ground substance. The most common type of cartilage we have in our body is called hyaline cartilage. And again, hyaline cartilage, cartilage is part of our skeletal system. So we'll talk more about this when we get to the skeletal system. But hyaline cartilage has a lot of collagen fibers. Cartilage is very, very, very strong. It's also incredibly flexible. Well, what makes cartilage strong is the fact it's full of these collagen fibers. What makes it flexible is that there's a lot of space in between the cells. And this is another side note, cartilage is avascular, which means it doesn't have blood vessels that go to it. So it gets all of its um, nutrients through diffusion and osmosis. This is why if you tear your cartilage, a lot of times you have to have it surgically fixed because it takes a long time for cartilage to heal itself. But also with cartilage, again, it supports and reinforces. And when you're first born, 99% of your cartilage is made from hyaline cartilage. It makes up our embryonic skeleton. And over time, the cartilage cells will start to die. Cartilage does not turn into bone. Cartilage gets replaced through a process called ossification, which we'll do more when we do the skeletal system. But when you're born, your body is 99% cartilage, and that's what makes it flexible so that you can stay in the wound and you can be born. But over time, our embryonic skeletal cartilage gets replaced by the bone that makes up our skeleton. But we do keep some of this cartilage in our joints. It's what we call articular cartilage, and it helps keep our bones from rubbing up against each other. We also have this cartilage in our rib cage. Our ribs have to be able to open and close, open and close, and so they have to be able to stretch, they have to be able to flex. We also have this cartilage right here on our nose. If you ever wonder why isn't this bone? Well, it's sticking out, it's gonna get hit. So nature has made it flexible for us and it is made from hyaline cartilage. And we also have hyaline cartilage in our trachea. Okay. Our trachea is not muscle. If it were, when we bent our head, it'd be like taking a garden hose, we would cut off our oxygen supply. But it's not bone because it needs to be flexible so that we can kind of you know, move and manipulate our head around. And I don't know, let's get through that. The second type of cartilage we have is called elastic cartilage. So automatically know that this cartilage is pretty stretchy. And in the case of elastic cartilage, it gets its name because it does have collagen fibers, but it also has a different type of fiber called elastic fiber. Elastic fiber is more bouncy, it's more stretchy, it's like a rubber band. But you guys know over time, you know, a rubber band can stretch out and it does not go back to normal. Well, the elastic fibers are the same way. And we find elastic cartilage in our ears. Now, for our animal friends, they use their ears to amplify sound. You know that dogs, cats, horses, things like that, they can pick their ears up and they can kind of move their ears. Okay. And that's to collect the sound. Well, that's why our ears are made from elastic cartilage. It's a throwback to ancient times when our ears had to be able to be picked up and use them as like these satellite dishes to collect sound. Our ears don't do that anymore. They're there for a different, you know, they don't, we can't move our, our ears around and change our ear shape, but they're still made from elastic cartilage. The last type of cartilage is the strongest type of cartilage. It's called fibrocartilage. So immediately you know that this one is gets its name because of all the really, really, really strong fibers it has in it. And you can see from this picture, the little red dots are the cells, and you can see all these collagen fibers that make it up. It is incredibly strong. It's the strongest type of cartilage that we have. And it's found in what we call our intervertebral disc. And again, page 10 shows you all of these if you have the coloring book. The intervertebral discs are the discs between our vertebra that we stack upon, so they have to be very strong to withstand our weight and all that movement that our back has to be able to do. It's also found in what's called our symphys pubis. You have, there is no such thing as a hip bone, okay? Your hip bones are actually three bones on each side that are fused together, but in the front, they don't fuse. 
because if you're two, if your left hip bone and your right hip bone fuse together, we wouldn't be able to walk. So we have this really thick, strong piece of cartilage called the symphys pubis that's found between right in the front in the, what we call the pubic region. And that's there so it allows our hips to shift so that we can walk. And then last but not least, dentin. Just like dentine gum, dentin is what makes up your teeth. And yes, your teeth are organs. Most people don't think of our teeth as organs. We have 32 teeth, 16 on the top, 16 on the bottom. That's 32 organs in our mouth. And teeth are part of your digestive system. So we're gonna talk about that. A lot of times people think about enamel. Well, enamel is the covering around the dentin. And it is the strongest substance in your body. It's stronger than bone. It's easier to break a bone than it is to chip a tooth. 